regulatory activities. Since our last Humphrey Hawkins hearing in March, Congress passed with significant bipartisan support and the President signed into law S-2155, the Economic Growth Regulatory Relief and Consumer Protection Act. The primary purpose of this bill is to make targeted changes to simplify and improve the regulatory regime for community banks, credit unions, mid-sized banks, and regional banks to promote economic growth. A key provision of the bill provides immediate relief from enhanced prudential standards to banks with $100 billion in total assets or less. The bill also authorizes the Fed to provide immediate relief from unnecessary enhanced prudential standards to banks with between $100 billion and $250 billion in assets. It's my hope that the Fed promptly provides relief to those within these thresholds. By right-sizing regulation, the bill will improve access to capital for consumers and small businesses that help drive our economy. And the banking regulators are already considering this bill in some of their statements and rulemakings. Earlier this month, the Fed, FDIC, and OCC issued a joint statement outlining rules and reporting requirements immediately impacted by the bill, including a separate letter issued by the Fed that was particularly focused on those impacting smaller, less complex banks. But there is still much work to do on the bill's implementation. As the Fed and other agencies revisit past rules and develop new rules in conjunction with the bill, it is my expectation that such rules will be developed consistent with the purpose of the bill and the intent of the members of Congress who voted for the bill. With respect to monetary policy, the Fed continues to monitor and respond to market developments and economic conditions. In recent comments at a European Central Bank forum on central banking, Chairman Powell described the state of the U.S. economy, saying, today, most Americans who want jobs can find them. High demand for workers should support wage growth and labor force participation. Looking ahead, the job market is likely to strengthen further. Real gross domestic product in the United States is now reported to have risen 2.75% over the past four quarters, well above most estimates of its long-run trend. Many forecasters expect the unemployment rate to fall into the mid-threes and to remain there for an extended period. According to the FOMC's June meeting minutes, the FOMC meeting participants agreed that the labor market has continued to strengthen and economic activity has been rising at a solid rate. Additionally, job gains have been strong and inflation has moved closer to the 2% target. The Fed also noted that the recently passed tax reform legislation has contributed to these favorable economic factors. I'm encouraged by these recent economic developments and look forward to seeing our bill's meaningful contribution to the prosperity of consumers and households. As economic conditions improve, the Fed faces critical decisions with respect to the level and trajectory of short-term interest rates and the size of its balance sheet. I look forward to hearing more from Chairman Powell about the Fed's monetary policy outlook and the ongoing effort to review, improve, and tailor regulations consistent with the Economic Growth Regulatory Relief and Consumer Protection Act. Senator Brown. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, welcome. Mr. Chair, it's nice to see you again. This week, the President of the United States went overseas and sided with the President of Russia while denigrating critical American institutions, including the press, the intelligence community, and the rule of law. Our colleague, Senator McCain, expressed clearly what every patriotic American thought No prior president has ever abased himself more abjectly before a tyrant. Not only did President Trump fail to speak the truth about an adversary, but speaking for America to the world, our president failed to defend all that makes us who we are, a republic of free people dedicated to the cause of liberty at home and abroad. American presidents must be the champions of that cause if it is to succeed. The words of the 2008 Republican presidential nominee. With our democratic institutions under threat, we cannot ignore what happened in Helsinki yesterday. But we must must not lose sight of the other special interest policies of this administration, including the rollback, rollback of the rules put in place to prevent the next economic crisis. Just last week, a federal official, a Federal Reserve official said, 
There are definitely downsized risks, but the strength of the economy is really pretty important at the moment. The fundamentals for the U.S. economy are very strong. That may be true for Wall Street, but for most of Americans, for most of America, workers haven't seen a real raise in years. Young Americans are drowning in student loan debt. Families are trying to buy their first home. For most of America, the strength of the economy is an open question. Last month, former Fed Chair Ben Bernanke was very clear about the long-term impact of the tax cut in the recent bump in federal spending when he said, in 2020, Wiley Coyote is going to go off the cliff. Last week, the San Francisco Fed released a study finding that the rosy forecasts of the tax bill are likely, quote, overly optimistic. It found that the bill's boost to growth is likely to be well below projections or even as small as zero. It suggested that these policies can make it difficult to respond to future economic downturns and manage growing federal debt. And it's not just the tax bill. The economic recovery hasn't been evenly felt across the country, not even close. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter into the record an article from the New York Times this weekend which talks about those families still struggling from the lack of meaningful raises and other job opportunities. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. While our hours have, in, while hours have increased a bit over the past year for workers as a whole, real hourly earnings have not. For production and non-supervisory workers, hours are flat. Pay has actually dropped slightly according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The number of jobs created in 2017 was smaller than each of the previous four years. Not what we hear in the mainstream media, perhaps. Some of the very companies that announced billions in buybacks and dividends are now announcing layoffs, shutting down factories, offshoring more jobs. Some of the biggest buybacks, as we know in this committee, are in the banking industry, assisted in part by the Federal Reserve's increasingly lax approach to financial oversight. Earlier this month, as part of the annual stress test, the Fed allowed the seven largest banks to redirect $96 billion to dividends and buybacks. This money might have been used, as the president and members of the majority party like to promise during the tax bill. This money might have been used uh, to pay workers, to reduce fees for consumers, to protect taxpayers from bailouts, or be deployed to help American businesses. Three banks, Goldman, Morgan Stanley, State Street, all had capital below the amount required to pass the stress test, but the Fed gave them passing grades anyway. The Fed wants to make the test, the test easier next year. Vice Chair Quarles has suggested he wants to give bankers more leeway to comment on the test before they're administered. Guess it's okay in Washington to, help student, to let students help write the exam. The Fed is considering dropping the qualitative portion of the stress test altogether, even though banks like Deutsche Bank and, and, and um, Santander and Citigroup and HSBC and RBS have failed on qualitative grounds before. That doesn't even include the changes the Fed is working on after Congress passed 2155 to weaken Dodd-Frank, making company-run stress tests for the largest banks periodic instead of annual and exempting more banks from stress tests Altogether, and, and, and oh yeah, Vice Chair Quarles has also made it clear that massive foreign, massive foreign banks can expect goodies too. And on and on and on it goes. The regulators loosen rules around big capital, dismantle the CFPB, ignore the rule, rule of the F, of FSOC, undermine the Volcker Rule, weaken the Community Reinvestment Act. When banks make record profits, we should be preparing the financial system for the next crisis. We should build up capital. We should invest in workers. We should combat asset bubbles. And we should be turning our attention to bigger issues that don't get enough attention, like how the value of work that we place in work has declined in this country, how our economy increasingly measures success only in quarterly earning reports. Much of that is up to Congress to address over the last six months. Tragically, I've seen the Fed moving in the direction of making it easy to direct financial institutions to cut corners, and I've only become more worried about our preparedness for the next crisis. I look forward to the testimony, Mr. Chairman. And welcome, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Brown. And again, Chairman Powell, welcome. We appreciate you testifying today, and we look forward to your opening statement. You may proceed. Um, Good morning, Chairman Crapo, Ranking Member Brown, and other members of the committee. I'm happy to present the Federal Reserve's semi-annual monetary policy report to the Congress today. 
And let me start by saying that my colleagues and I strongly support the goals that Congress has set for monetary policy, maximum employment and price stability. We also support clear and open communication about the policies we undertake to achieve these goals. We owe you and the public in general clear explanations of what we're doing and why we are doing it. Monetary policy affects everyone and should be a mystery to no one. For the past three years, we've been gradually returning interest rates and the Fed's securities holdings to more normal levels as the economy has strengthened. We believe that this is the best way we can help set conditions in which Americans who want a job can find one and in which inflation remains low and stable. So I, I will review the current economic situation and outlook, and then I'll turn to monetary policy. Since I last testified here in February, the job market has continued to strengthen and inflation has moved up. In the most recent data, inflation was a little above 2 percent, the level that the Federal Open Market Committee thinks will best achieve our price stability and employment objectives over the longer term. The latest figure was boosted by a significant increase in gasoline and other energy prices. An average of 215,000 net new jobs per month were created each month in the first half of this year. That number is somewhat higher than the monthly average of 2017. It's also a good deal higher than the average number of people who enter the workforce each month on net. The unemployment rate edged down 0.1 percent over the first half of the year to 4.0 percent in June, near the lowest level of the past two decades. In addition, the share of the population that either has a job or has looked for one in the past month, what we call the labor force participation rate, has not changed much since late 2013. And this development is another sign of labor market strength. Part of what has kept the participation rate stable is that more working age people have started looking for a job, which has helped make up for the large number of baby boomers who are retiring and leaving the labor force. Another piece of good news is that the robust conditions in the labor market are being felt by many different groups. For example, the unemployment rates for African Americans and Hispanics have fallen sharply over the past few years and are now near their lowest levels since the Bureau of Labor Statistics began reporting these data uh, in 1972. Groups with higher unemployment rates have tended to benefit the most as the job market has strengthened. But jobless rates for these groups are still higher than those for whites, and while three-fourths of whites responded in a recent Fed survey that they were doing at least okay financially, only two-thirds of African Americans and Hispanics responded that way. Incoming data show that, alongside the strong job market, the U.S. economy has grown at a solid pace so far this year. The value of goods and services produced in the economy, or GDP, rose at a moderate annual rate of 2 percent in the first quarter after adjusting for inflation. However, the latest data suggests that economic growth in the second quarter uh, has been considerably stronger than in the first. The solid pace of growth so far this year is based on several factors. Robust job gains, rising after-tax income, and optimism among households have lifted consumer spending in recent months. Investment by businesses has continued to grow at a healthy rate. Good economic performance in other countries has supported U.S. exports and manufacturing. And while housing construction has not increased this year, it is up noticeably from where it stood a few years ago. Turning to inflation, after several years in which inflation ran below our 2 percent objective, the recent data are more encouraging. The price index for personal consumption expenditures, or PCE inflation, and over